early, and I never really, picked, you know, took up took up the banjo because it, my name was in it. It did, it wasn't it didn't. <laughs> nice. I'm glad you're really you're tracking today, right? Okay. Good. Glad you're here. <clears throat> well, anyway, I am. Um, you know, I started playing banjo, and and I say this because this was what we you know we're. This is hopefully is you guys got me back there. Um, I started playing banjo. There we go. Thank you. Um, at least I started in my mind. I started in my mind before I started playing. I started in my mind playing the banjo when I was 15. And uh, <clears throat> Let me back up a little bit. When I was a kid, my mom died when I was about 10, when I was 10 years old. And my dad had um, four teenagers, soon to have four teenagers at home. My dad was a research engineer, and he had to work. And his wife had died of cancer, and so his life was pretty, he was a mess, and it was complicated. And we were not the most, we were not the easiest children I just, my siblings were way worse than me. I just want you to know that. And um, so uh, we had a cabin at Spirit Lake. And Spirit Lake is, if you know anything about this area up at Mount St. Helens, it was this beautiful, uh, like, park-like wilderness place. Um, trying to, I, I say if you were to take the redwoods and Yosemite and kind of, try and put them together in some meaningful way, you could get a little bit close to how beautiful it was, but it still probably wouldn't quite cut it. Um, I go to Packwood Lake a lot in this area. It's similar, but it was a beautiful place. And we had a cabin about a mile below the lake on the Toodle River. It was 30 miles to the nearest electricity, and it was 30 miles to the nearest telephone. And by the way, in those days, they didn't have cell phones. There were no cell phones, no landlines there. We had no running water, just had an outhouse. For you younger kids, that's an outhouse. Um, <laughs> if you didn't know, uh, that's kind of code for out. Yeah, anyway. <clears throat> so my dad's logic, though it was flawed, was, uh, but he, he had no good choices. And so my dad was, confronted with two choices, hard choice and disastrous choice. The, the choice that he thought was probably most disastrous would have been to leave the th four teenagers running amok while he was at work all summer in town. His gamble was, why don't I take them to the cabin? At this point in their lives, they kind of like it. I'll just take them up there and drop them off for the whole summer. Yeah, I know, and that's something. It's, but it, it, to be honest, there was only like there was there was less than eleven, probably half of that. But they listed there was eleven permanent residents there. So they, and one of them was Harry Truman. So how much trouble are you going to get into? Um, <laughs> and and uh, there was our cabin was surrounded by a wilderness area on three sides, and. Uh, you know, how much trouble could we get into? And we did get into trouble, but there was really nobody to know much. And my dad would come up on the weekends and make sure we were still alive and bring food. And we did eat a lot of pancakes. Well, that's a long way to get to the point. I was there, 15 years old, and I got invited. I didn't really get invited. I just showed up. I went to this place called Harmony Falls Lodge. It was on the banks of Spirit Lake. It was a beautiful place, just all big, huge trees and beautiful waterfall. And uh, it was a resort there. And there were these two brothers that were playing music. So I heard that and I thought, man, I'm going to go. And so I kind of busted into the party. And um, there was a guy, the one brother named Peter was sitting on an unlit cook stove playing the banjo. And I had never, ever seen or heard a banjo before in person. And I was just stunned. 
I was, it was like I was struck by lightning. I know some of you feel like you're struck by lightning when the banjo gets played too, but in a different way. Uh, but I was just struck. I thought, that is so great. I've got to play that thing. And so I, um, you know, I went back to school that fall and I saved up some money and I bought a bad banjo from a pawn shop and I started learning how to play it. I started the torturous journey of being a banjo player. I thought it was great, but my family thought it was torturous. That's what they called it. It was just like all day long me going. And then that summer, the next summer, I played every day, all day. I was up in the mountains all every summer up until I was a junior in high school. And so I am, um, I, I would just play all day long. My poor sister, well, she started speaking to me again this summer. Um, and uh, there were some other issues too, but that, that, uh, that was probably a contributor. And, uh, but this became a big part of my life, you know, when I was in school and I just, I, I played with my friends. I found some friends that we played music together and, and then the interesting thing was there was a lot of older guys at that time that were into that kind of music. I didn't know anybody else, but they kind of took us aside and they were, a lot of them were believers. A lot of them were Christian guys and they, they liked gospel, you know, and they would, and it wasn't lost on me. I, it was kind of an, in a indirect way, they were kind of getting this through to me. And one, you know, one fella, he would teach me a song, you know, but I had to play it exactly like he wanted. He was a fiddler. And I had to play it exactly like he wanted. It. And if I varied a little bit, you know, put a little flourish in there, like, he stuck, whoa, that's not how it's played. <laughs> he was a real, like, like a real musical, you know, like bluegrass kind of purist dude. And, um, but the years went by, and of course, you know, there was, you know, when you have that kind of an experience growing up, you have, your life can get pretty complicated, and my life did get complicated, and uh, lots of, you know, sin enters in, and you, your life begins to get broken up. But when I was, um, but then, then there came this moment, I was, I was working, and I, I lived in a little dumpy house in West Calso. And one night, I'd, I'd come over a period of time through a lot of things to like intellectually kind of believe, like to have faith intellectually, like Jesus is who he says he is, that he died, that he rose again. You know, he's awesome. But it didn't really do much. You know, I mean, it was just like knowledge. And then there was a few moments, like many of you may have had, where you like get in a crisis and you cry out to God, you know, that kind of emotional, like, I'm in a panic, save me. Uh, I had a couple of those, but they didn't last, you know. They had, they had about a 48-hour shelf life. They didn't really uh, bring long-term transformation. But this night was different. You know, the work of grace was powerful in my life, and God had been dealing with a lot of things, and I got down on my knees next to my bed and I prayed to, you know, just I just repented and I just turned my life, my whole life, as much as I knew of it, over to Christ. And that included, and including my banjo, which was a big deal. And, um, and then I knew this girl named Sue, who is my lovely wife now. And in time we married. And as God would have it, God called me into the ministry. Now, it was an amazing thing, and it was especially amazing to a lot of the people that knew me and that I went to church with. They were like, there's just no way that's going to happen. And, um, but um, there, Nelson, one day, um, some other folks invited me to come and, and preach here, they, a little bit of church here, and meeting down in the movie theater years ago. And I started to preach, and oh, folks, it was bad. I mean, it was the torturous process of them letting me kind of figure out how this is done and what to what to do, and it it was it was it was bad. And um, but in the process, in in the middle of all this, my lovely wife worked at a music store, and she bought me this awesome gift. And um, 
she had gotten a super deal and she surprised me and it was a brand new banjo really like top top of the line super like ex would normally be really expensive and i was just shocked because we were like really poor at the time we we had no money basically and being but but here's the problem and i'm just please do not start throwing things when i tell you this being a newly minted super preacher, <laughs> you know the drill, right? Yeah, some of you. And I, and being Mr. Super Spiritual, I thought, no, I can't keep it. I've got to take it and get the money and get something more suited for my high calling in Toledo. I know, isn't that terrible? She forgave me, but... She's just like, I don't even know that she was mad. She's just like, really? Wow. And uh, that became probably the beginning of many wows over the years. <laughs> but um, so I went and got something more suited for the high calling in Toledo. I bought a three-piece suit. <laughs> Stop. So you, you got it. It's worse. It's even worse. It was it was three piece brown pinstripe. It was the ugliest suit. It I'm sure they'd had it hanging since before the war, World War Two, <laughs> and uh, and they probably I'm sure the guys in the, it was a kind of a fancy schmancy shop. You know, I'm sure the guys that sold it to me probably had a had some money on it to see who could sell it to some because I didn't know anything about it. I never wore suits, you know. I didn't know anything about it. And so I buy this suit. It's horrible. And I show up at Toledo suited, all suited up, but not really suitable because I was the only suited person in a handful of banjo lovers. That's the only people that were here. They're all a bunch of people from, well, they were just people that didn't care. And I, I, I think there may have been a couple of bolo ties Maybe Marvin had a bolo tie or somebody. Maybe in the day, Bobby could have been. But, and that was in the day when people like, you know, it was more common for people to like get all dressed up for church, you know. And, uh, but, uh, you know, the arrogance of that and the kind of silliness of that thinking still kind of confounds me. Um, you know, and, and I've, thought, I've thought it back through and, I realize this, that God, now in retrospect, I can look back and I can say, you know, God made me who I am. He knew my experiences. He knew where I'd come from. He saved me. You know, God isn't responsible for my failures and sins, but he saved me out of that. He shaped my life. He gifted me. He called me into this work. And, and the Bible says in Ephesians, it said, I am his workmanship, and so are you, created in Christ Jesus for good works. You know, I'm, you're, I'm a, I was a unique creation, but I had a thinking in my mind that I got somewhere that in my mind, what loving, what loving people to Christ really took. And you know what I thought? I really was convinced so much so that loving people to Christ at that point took a nasty brown three-piece suit. I really thought it was it. I really thought it, <laughs> that was it. And it certainly did not take a banjo. I mean, that's just ridiculous. I'm not even sure that can be spiritual at all. And it took me a while to realize that God had put me together as a unique package, and that included the banjo and a whole bunch of other stuff. And you go, that's for sure. You're a weird person. And don't do that anyway. Um, but he had put me together and like nobody else for his purpose. But that's true for you too. You are unique. You are like nobody else. You too have talents and you have skills and you've had professional experiences and you've had failures and you've have, you have relationships and connections with family members and and you have abilities, relationships, as I said, gifts. And for those of you, you have a calling that is unique and special to you. 
And the reason is, is because you as an individual, as has true, been true in my life, you, you are to be a unique expression of God's grace to the world. You are a unique expression of that. And you're the only one that can share your unique expression of God's grace. You're it. It doesn't mean God's grace can't be shared, but you are the only one that can share your version, your expression of it. The, the reality is, here's, I know this sounds almost dumb, it's so simple, but you are the absolutely only person that can do you. You are the only person in the entire world, really, in this universe that can do you. You're it. And you are the only one who can do your specific way, nuance, whatever, unique way to share the gospel with other people. And the problem I was having is probably the problem that you deal with too. We think that we have to do it like other people. But that's exactly the wrong thing to think. You're not supposed to do it like other people. You know, the, Jesus said, and we're taught from the apostles, that the, the church, both the local church and in, in, in the broader sense, is a body, and he is the head of the body. And the, we're to re express that. You know, well, how many pancreases does the body need? And what if the pancreas starts getting liver envy? <laughs> You know, what I'm saying is if the pancreas begins to think I need to be like the liver, you know, that's not going to, that's not how, that's, that's a totally wrong thinking. And yet so much of what we do, I'm not saying we can't learn from people and there isn't a healthy type of imitation that we can do. But when we begin to say, oh, I've got to do this. I've got to do this. I've got to make myself like somebody else. I've got to, you know, push myself down into this mold. That is exactly not what God wants. And I did that for a long time. And it's a trap and it's, it's, really, it's really soul grinding. And so I wanted to share with you that you are unique in both gifting and the expression of that gift. And so you've got to stop trying to suit up. And you, you know, when I finally, you know, I played for a while and I played with guys and I don't get to play as much as I want to now. But, but I'll give you an example like this. Some of you know this. I wandered so aimless, life filled with sin. I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like an angel in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light. I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I was a fool to wander astray. For straight is the gate and narrow is the way. Now I have traded the wrong for the right. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. You know this? I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. And that'll preach, see? If you, it doesn't matter whether it's banjo playing or what you might do. There's a vehicle by which God can use whatever your particular gifting is. And that's why Paul said, you have to stop trying to be like somebody else and recognize this idea of, of the variation within all of you as a part of a body. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but there is the same spirit. And there are varieties of ministries in the same Lord. And there are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for what? The common good. Your purpose in this, whatever God builds into your life and gifts you with, 
is for the common good, to build up the body. You know, Peter wants you, the book of 1 Peter that we've been going through, is they're in a period in the culture where they're being persecuted and, and they're being pressured and, and they're being pushed toward conforming and caving in and they're, they're being accused of things they didn't do. And Peter's saying, let me tell you how to be a fruitful, stable person. You're lively stones. I want you to be solid for me, no matter what's going on around you. I want you to be able to live your lives and love in a way that you really share grace to other people. And so that's why he goes on to tell them in this next passage, as each one of us has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as a good steward or a good manager of the as the obvious, the made known, the expressed manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. And whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies. So that in the things God may, may in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom belongs the glory and the dominion forever and ever. You see, how do you do that, though? How do you, it's so easy to say, well, how do I go about doing that? Well, let me just give you four things, and I'll try and move pretty quick through these. Number one, he says the first thing is you've got to receive your gifting. This is very important that you understand that you are to receive your gifting. He says, as each one has received a special gift, you receive the gift of salvation by faith. That's what the Bible says. But as many as received him in John 1.12, to them he gave the power, the right, the privilege to become the children of God, even to them that believed on his name. So you believe in him, you're embracing him, but he's receiving you as well. And at the moment you give your life to Christ, we know this, that each person who receives Christ as Lord and Savior receives a special gift. This Greek word, charisma, or charisma, we hear it a lot of times people use it in reference to the charismatic movement. But the word here literally means grace, a grace gift. It literally means a miraculous, you know, faculty, something you, some supernatural ability, some way of doing something or something that you can do that demonstrates the grace of God. It's a free gift. It's a special ability. And it's oftentimes, the experience teaches that it's matched with your unique makeup to build up the church because the purpose of, of a spiritual gifting is not for you to like draw attention to yourself or to you know build your own little empire or to or whatever you're doing the purpose of your spiritual gifting is to build up the church whatever ministry you're involved in whether you're no matter what your ministry is or what your you you say or what your gifting is its underlying purpose is to build up the local body to build up the church in general both in numbers and in strength a lot of people are able to do things, but they're always out trying to freelance it. And they're either, they're either not gifted or they are misusing the gift. This is why he says in um, Ephesians 4.12, when he speaks about gifting, the giftings that are given to the church, they are for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, for what? To the building up of the body of Christ. It's to build up. So the thing you look for is you say, how do I know what my gifting is? Well, where does your gifting build up the body? Where does your gifting build up the body? Where does your activity, what you do, build people up, build up the, the, the community of faith? You know, if whenever you, you do something, it just kind of, if what you're doing is just, is just always going downhill, and isn't really building up the body, it may not be your gifting. Likely isn't. So that brings me to the second thing, which is you've got to recognize you've received a special gift, but you've got to, I'm sorry, there we go, recognize your gifting. You he has received a special gift. <sighs> 
What is it about you that God will empower? What is it in your life? What, what something about you? What ability or relationship or, or experience? or what, what is it about you that God is going to empower to build up his church? I want you to expand your thinking about this and not get locked into a bunch of lists. Because your gifting is, as I said, where your activity builds up the body. Now, maybe you're a great cook. You think, well, cooking's not on the list of gifts. Well, no, but cooking could be the way you apply the gift. For example, some of you are great cooks. God may use your ability to cook to give you an ability to share truth with people or to encourage people or to serve people. Particularly if you make these really nice little blackberry pies, I could be greatly, uh, you could use your gift to greatly encourage me uh, in, in that. I think, I, I, uh, yeah, I'm not, that was not, you don't have to take notes on that. But anyway, um, maybe you are a person who is kind of temperamentally more organized. And God may see that and he knows you, he knows all about you, and he... He gives you, he gifts you with the gift of uh, the supernatural plus of, of administration where you can see a situation and you can see all the parts and you can put it all together and you can make it work. And you have a great spirit about it. You're not a control freak. You just, just like to just make things work together and function in a healthy way. Or maybe you're a good listener. Maybe the way you grew up or your experience or whatever, you just know how to listen to people, personality. I don't know. God may enable you along with that, the way he shaped you, empower you with the gift of counsel. It could be other things too. That you can listen to people and you can figure things out and help them figure things out. Maybe you love to talk to people and you can just like, you never met a stranger and you're just that type of a person. And, and for some reason, you can always get right to the, you know, get people to talk about what's going on. Maybe God's given you a special gifting. Maybe you're a gifting to the church in evangelism. Maybe that's your thing. And people will come to know the Lord and that'll demonstrate itself very obviously. Or maybe you're a person who's just curious and you love learning, but you don't just love learning. You love explaining things and you love to, you, you can take complicated things and make them very simple so that anybody can understand them. Maybe your gifting is teaching. You know, there was a man that used to go to this church. I've talked about him before, but he was my friend and he was, he was from West Virginia. His name was Elmer Blankenship. Some of you knew him and Elmer was was loved hunting. He was a hunting. I didn't know how much of a hunter he really was because he raised like, he did a type of hunting I'm not very, wasn't very interested in was hound hunting. You know, it's a whole kind of subset of hunters. And I was up way up in the mountains one time and I met this guy who was from another state, another place. And, and uh, we were just talking around a campfire and we were talking. He said, well, I used to be a hound hunter. And I go, oh, really? I said. This will make me have to stay in one place, which is very annoying. But if you can bring me a couple batteries, I'll, I'll fix you up. But at any rate, you know, this guy named Bob, he go, I go, I knew this guy. His name was Elmer Blankenship. He goes, you knew Elmer Blankenship? I go, yeah. He goes, he's famous. I go, oh, yeah? I go, he goes, he was the most famous hound dog trainer, hunter in the West. I go, Really? He goes, yeah, did you know his dog sold for like seven to $10,000 a piece? I go, really? He never told me that. It wasn't the way he was. And uh, I go, well, did you ever meet Elmer? He's a really nice guy. He goes, oh, no, I could never get close enough to him. Like he was like a celebrity. And I was like, um, but, you know, I, Elmer, uh, Elmer passed away a few years ago. Just a couple of do it. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. And um, he 
he passed away and I went to do his funeral. It was up in Forks and it was the middle of the week. And um, it was a bunch of, uh, and it was, you know, it was work week. It's like a Thursday at 10 in the morning. And there was, it was a congregation a little bit smaller, building a little bit smaller than this, but it was packed. You know, it was all packed almost, I'd say 80% of them were all guys, young guys. And here's what they began to say. Oh, Elmer. And Elmer was a really great guy, a great Christian. Not perfect, but a really credible believer. And he, uh, these young guys would get up and say, this, this story happened over and over because, you know, I, had, I grew up, my dad left or my dad died. I never had a dad. But Elmer was, he took me hunting. And he talked to me about life. And he talked to me about being a man. And he talked to me about the Lord. And, and I, I would say in that, you know, you're trying to have, a, I had to cut him off because there's like 20 of these guys are all in their 20s and 30s. He was, what he did was he loved hunting, but he took this thing that he loved and he used it as a way, he had a gift of encouragement. He always had stories. He always had this ability to like build somebody up, to give advice. And um, there was a couple things he might not have, should have advised people in. But other than that, uh, it was, uh, he was like anybody else. But, but he was just a great guy. I love this guy. And you see, who'd have thought that was his unique something. And he used his gift in that way. And, and don't get me wrong. He helped around here. He was a servant. I can remember hang hang a sheetrock with him up here in this high area. But my question to you is in in recognizing your gifting, God has put the plus of his power on your on you and he gives grace through your life in a specific way. And so that's why it's very important that you employ it. You see, you have to employ your gifting. That's why he says in this passage, Peter's speaking to these Christians. And he's saying, employ it in serving one another as good stewards, it's supposed to say, of the manifold grace of God. Employ it in serving one another. You know, all of us have a tendency in our lives to want to be taken care of, don't we? We do. And it creeps into us, into the church too, because we want, like it's very easy, especially in America, where we have a lot of freedom and there's lots of churches, where we can think, well, we become kind of Christian consumers. You know, and we stop at the local, um, you know, stop and go Christian outlet. And we go and we can go to church and we can think, I didn't get nothing out of that. <laughs> Our... I, I'm not getting fed, i.e., no, I want to remind you, not getting fed does not, is not necessarily a one-sided thing. Sometimes you are not very feedable, okay? Or you just think that you're going to get, that being fed just means this. You're just like a little bird, ah, 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 and that somebody's going to just do it all for you, and they're just going to make you grow. You know, unscrew the little top of your head and pour in the gospel, you know, and now you're a disciple. You know, um, folks, that's just a wrong kind of thinking. People pull into the, you know, and if they, if you don't have a, you know, super fabulous discount special on God, then they're down the road to the next, next stop off center. Or if they don't get what they want or they don't get, you know, their ego stroked, whatever. The reality is you are to employ your spiritual gift. It is easy for us to want to just be taken care of. But if you want to, and I'm not talking about the easy life. I'm not talking about the painless life. But if you want to grow into the exciting life that God has planned for you as a follower of Jesus, and if you want to stay in that life, because I got news for you, what you were at 50 or 30 is not what you will be at 80 or 70 unless you're intentional about it. We all want to be taken care of. And if you want to stay in that exciting life that God has for you, you must serve. We all get tired and sometimes you got to take a break. You got to just take some time to settle out and kind of get your bearings, maybe get your own walk with God squared away. But to experience his unexplainable power, you must serve him and serve his people. We all can get dry spiritually. It's easy to get spiritually dry. I know I have. 
But you don't get more water by running a conservation program. You get more water by drilling down deeper. And you know, you don't get out of a spiritual dryness by going all conserving yourself and pulling yourself back and getting up in your little little cocoon. You get there by drilling down into serving other people. And it will be hard and difficult. Drilling's hard sometimes. But Jesus said it like this. If you save your life, if you try and save your life, you lose it. You will lose it. You'll miss it. You won't live your life. He's not just talking about death. He's talking about if whoever tries to save their life will absolutely for sure miss it, lose it. So he's, Peter is saying, put it to work. God doesn't work powerfully through the spiritually unemployed, folks. He just doesn't. You know what the devil is always, the moment you gave your life to Jesus, he had an agenda. And it's still working. See, the devil never changes his plan because it's very clear. The devil has one agenda, is to limit, once you give your life to Jesus, is to limit your ability to impact anybody in your life. To keep you from affecting your kids and your grandkids and your neighbors and your friends and your old friends, new friends, co-workers, kids you go to school with. He doesn't want your life to have any impact whatsoever. So if it takes him a year to neutralize your influence, he'll take a year. If it takes him 20, he'll take 20. He doesn't care because that's his agenda. If he, if he does it sitting in a pew, he'll do it. If he does it laying in a gutter, he'll do it. He doesn't care. He just wants your influence to not affect anybody for good. So the devil always lures the Christian to unemployment, to just not do anything. And if he's really successful, he'll try and convince you into spiritual retirement. You're just going to kick back. I did my part. Look, I've, I've been doing my part and, and I've done my bit and, you know, but listen, you have a special gift. That's what he says. You have a special gift. You have a unique combination that only you can express. You are the only one that can express grace the way you can express grace. Did you know that? There's nobody else. You're the only one that can do you, period. And in that thing, you are not replaceable. Did you know something? There's this kind of mechanical mentality among Christians that people are like, like units or like little components. And, you know, you just can plug them in and out and pull them in and out. That doesn't work like that. We're relational units. We're relational, we're relational kind of creatures made by God. We're not like, eh, pull that out, put a new, put a new dad module in your family. How's that work? Or plug in a new mom module. No. These are relationships. You are not replaceable. And so it's important that you are ready as a church, as a community that has opportunities and new opportunities for you to serve and to try new things and to serve, to serve somehow, to invest in lives. To, it might be in the building or out of the building. It might be in your job or it might be in your family. I don't know. But that you will work with people to bring them to all that God wants them to be. You see, you are to be a good steward with God's grace in your life, the manifold, the knowledge, the known, seeable, manifest grace of God. You to be a good steward with it. And, you know, I'd like to, it'd be much more easy for me to tell you, oh, you know, just, just relax. Yeah, sure. Just, just roll with it. No big deal. I don't want to upset you or make you I'm not. Look, and I, I have no interest in giving you a guilt trip. That's not my point at all. I'm simply telling you, look, you're missing it. You're going to miss out on what life for you is supposed to be in the Lord. You are to be a good steward in serving one another as his, in his manifold grace. Let me just tell, tell it to you like this. Listen, especially if you're older, listen very carefully. If you do not put your gift to work, Listen, if you do not put your gift to work, I don't care whether it's giving or, 
or praying or whatever you're doing, if you are not putting your gift to work, your unique gift, your unique expression of grace will be lost to the world forever. It's not going to happen. I can't do it for you. I can't express grace like you express grace, and you can't do it like I do. Your unique offering to God and to this world is going to be lost. Nobody else is going to do it, and it can't be got back. And God, God, and the opportunity for God to get that glory is missed. So what do you do? You say, well, I can't do that. I mean, look, I'm tired just listening to you. <laughs> I mean, I got a headache right here just hearing that banjo, one song. Man, lightning, you talk about lightning, try migraine. I got that, you know. No, I get it. You know, there's a guy that used to, he's not here too much. He comes once in a while, and he always makes me warn him when I'm going to play the banjo. He says, there's a nerve in my head, and you're on it. <laughs> um, but you know, you say, I can't do that. Well, that's the last one. You have to empower your gifting. You say, well, I thought God empowered it. Well, yes, he does, but you have to be willing. And that means you have to change the way you think about your place of serving. Whether it's your church or whether it's your family or whether it's your church and your family, whether it's the places that God has put you where you can make a difference. You have to change the way you think about it. And you have to change your thinking about your power in God. All of this depressing, we can't do anything, is got to get, you got to get out of that. Look, these people were ministering and serving in the Roman Empire where they, were, they had no friends in high places. And they turned the world upside down. You've got to empower it by changing the way you think about your place in history and in time. Look, folks, you don't get to sit around pining about the good old days, if they even were. This is our time right now. This is it. This is our chance to make a difference. And you've got to quit. You've got to change your thinking about the kind of power that you have and quit minimalizing and talking it down. You, God has given you a supernatural ability. That's why he says, whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. You have confidence. I am talking to you because God has placed me in a place in your life where I can speak to you as God wants you to hear. Whoever serves is to do as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies. God, I don't, God, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but you're going to give me the strength to do what you called me to do. So that in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. This says, so in all things, I can feel fulfilled. No. So in all things, I can be around people who are nice. No. So in all things, I can be, you fill in the blanks. I could be comfortable. No. So in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. See, he's saying you empower your gifting by depending on his power and recognizing that he placed you where you are for now, for a reason. There's a dimension of destiny to that. You know that God has destined every single one of you to greatness as you trust him. That's what he says. That he might get the glory. I'm not talking about a greatness that's, that we get in this, this world. Something transcending that. So you depend on his power and you be all you can be. And release all that you have to his glory. You release it all. You be all in, folks. Because let me tell you something. Being half-hearted, people that are half-hearted, they don't get anything done. Not even for themselves. You know, some of you know where that, you can understand where the term half-hearted came from. If you've dealt with heart disease, you've got like, you've got a, you've had a, bi, you had, a, I've talked to lots of people, they have a bypass. And all of a sudden they're like, man, I have so much more energy. I feel so much better. Well, half your heart was working. 
You say, well, I didn't feel that good after my bypass. I'm sorry, I'm not a surgeon. That's the extent of my medical knowledge. But what I'm saying to you is this, just don't go to seed on this. I'm just telling you that half-heartedness, being halfway in, oh, I'm just gonna do the minimum. That's, that, no, wonder you, no wonder you're not, you're gripey and not excited about your walk with God. So, so I'd like you to just take this card, would you? And look at it for a moment. This card is a way we can pray for you and we will pray for you. Put your name on it if you want us to contact you, the best way to contact you. You might have a prayer request, or want information about the church, but there is some specific things in this message. Number one, I want to receive the gift of God's grace through Jesus Christ now. You know, that's the most important thing you can do. You know, the spiritual gifting and empowering that I'm talking about is only for those who have trusted Jesus as the Lord and Savior. You've known about him, maybe like I did. You've cried out to him a few times, but have you really surrendered to him? Have you really repented, turned, and trusted him for yourself? And asked him and recognized and received him as your Lord and Savior? You need to do that now. Just cry out to him. You're here and you say, I want to recognize and release all I am to serve God and others. Well, we will pray about that for you. There's going to be lots of ways to get derailed, but it's a place to start. I want to employ my gifting to build up our church. You know what? I want to challenge you to do it. There's going to come opportunities. You need to look into them. You need to see, is this something, is this an area where it's a fit, where it fits with the things I've been, I've been, I've been God shaped into my life. There'll be those things. Danny's working on that with me. He's putting together a new set of training that we can do for people. And we'll be telling you more about it, but it'll be coming up. And it'll be a great place for you to be able to, where is my activity build up the body? Where can I fit that? And then pray I'll know God's power as I serve him. You know, that's the point. You will begin to know God's power as you serve him. You say, God, show me some power, then I'll serve you. It doesn't work like that. God doesn't pour his power into a stagnant pool. This doesn't. And it's always about serving other people. It's not just about ingratiating your information and building your library. It's about whatever you're learning is supposed to go into making you a more vibrant servant because what we celebrate here today is about the reality that our king above everything else was a servant and he's the one that you follow. You know, all these people, you know, all these things thrown at us about leadership and who's this and who's that. You know, Jesus is, was the, is the exact opposite of every model we have thrown at us as a great leader. His disciples wanted to be great worldly leaders. They said, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, I'd like to be vice president. And, you know, Jimmy here, he'd like to be second vice president. No, I want to be first vice president. Oh, well, we'll talk about it later. Jesus says, you don't get me at all, do you? He said, look, anybody, any of you wants to be great, you need to be a servant of everybody. He says, for even the son of man didn't come to be served. I'm God in the flesh. I didn't come to be served. I came to be a servant. And what did I do? I came to make myself, give myself as a ransom for many. That's what we remember. Why, do we, why are we called to remember this? Because it is so easy for us to be polluted and corrupted and to lose our vision of what, it re what greatness really means.